Welcome, everybody. This is Tyler and Douglas Gabriel. And Douglas has been asked some questions and I thought was really good. And when I was uh, putting his article up and doing some editing, I had my own questions and thoughts that would arise from that. Douglas, what is the topic that you um, are going to discuss today? Tell people what that is in general before I go too far. In the last couple of weeks, I've uh, received a few requests to address the question of the planet Vulcan and also what Rudolf Steiner calls the supermen from um, Venus, Mercury, and Vulcan. Well, that presents all kinds of new questions. And uh, as it's called by good old Cliff High, that gets you into the woo. Or you know, now, now you're taking one of my questions away. People because, call it the woo-woo, you see. Yeah, the woo, the woo. What is the woo? It's this place of, if you listen to Cliff, and yeah, I know Cliff goes off into tangents that we're not interested in, but still, he's having an experience, it's authentic, of this thing called woo, a place of discovery, a, of a place of universal wisdom. And when I was reading the comments the other day under one of his videos, some astute reader, listener, said, isn't the woo Sophia? And I was like, yeah, that's what he's experiencing, Sophia. You see, those questions and that framing gives me a chance to talk about all kinds of things, including multi-dimensions. When you have what Rudolf Steiner calls higher thinking, feeling, and willing, or imagination, inspiration, and intuition, you are actually going into the future you are going into other, what my, some people might call dimensions. And in fact, he calls it dimensions. He tells us that we are in a seven stage process of evolution and we are in the fourth stage right now. The first three stages come as somewhat of a, what they call the bathtub or the uh, curve that goes down into matter. And then it stops at the fourth, which is where we're at on earth on the fourth. And then it goes to the fifth, sixth and seventh, which are recapitulations of the third, the second, and the first. He I just want to make sure people understand you're talking about Rudolf Steiner, not Cliff, in this correct. description. Okay. Yes, I would uh, only use Rudolf Steiner as uh, authentication yes. or verification for anything I was saying, not good old Cliff, though I do like listening oh, to Cliff. Okay, I just want to clarify that, but please go on. I'm sorry to interrupt. It gets into the woo when you get with Cliff, and then Cliff starts telling you about extra dimensional beings and aliens and all this stuff. Why? Because he doesn't have a cosmology. But if you have a cosmology, you know what the past, the present, and the future are about. And you can actually make predictions. And you can also, also see that the three elemental kingdoms are the three elements of the past, and that the three future incarnations of the Earth, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan, and yes, Vulcan is a planet that is incorporeal at this point. It doesn't have physical nature, but it is definitely there in between what would be called Mercury and the sun. And this, with the woo here, we are really getting into some very questionable things because this opens up a whole uh, can of worms. Because when you say Mercury, Steiner's referring to occult Venus. When you say Venus, he's referring to occult Mercury. And then when you say Superman, and he should but in his time, he didn't do that. You say superhumans, I like to say superwomen, from um, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Vulcan. Note that that's different than his references to the future, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. Now, he clarifies this in a number of selections, which we'll have in the, um, in the notes below, where I grab a dozen different selections, quotations from Rudolf Steiner's different lectures, and let the person decide themselves after reading what he has to say. And there's really no correct answer to this, but it gave me the opportunity to address a few very big questions, which are questions as the following. If there are to be, and there he says there are right now and have been for quite some time, superhuman beings from Mercury, Venus, and Vulcan, then who are those beings? How do they manifest? And if he's actually talking about the future incarnations of the Earth, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan, then the question arises, is he actually talking about the capacities that will develop imagination, inspiration, and intuition, which develop in the three realms of your three higher selves, because you have three higher selves and a lower self. And the three higher selves are called spirit self, 
life spirit, spirit man or spirit human. Those are also called Mani, Buddha, and Atman, which are the ancient Indian terms for that. So one can then ask the question, and this is where the debate gets hot. And if you just simply do a query on the internet, Rudolf Steiner, Superman from Vulcan, you're going to find so many articles and so many people attempting to address this, and no one's going to give you an answer. And when you look at the selections that we've provided in the article uh, below this podcast, you still won't find an answer. You're going to have to decide yourself. And then I throw in a wild card, a real woo card, which is there's a reference. And by the way, in the article, there's a reference to an article that I wrote before about this topic uh, on ourspirit.com, O-U-R, spirit.com. And in that, I also mention, and in another place, another couple articles on that site, you'll find references to our older brothers and sisters from the Pleiades. Now, that quote is enough to make many anthroposophists pull their hair out, or as the um, thumbnail you did for this uh, particular talk, has a woman with red hair like her hair is on fire. She looks like a Brunhilde, a Valkyrie, coming to pick up her dead from the battlefield. Well, this reference to the Pleiadian older brothers and sisters opens yet another can of worms. So if there are older brothers and sisters, who are they? Are they our angels, archangels and archai, these beings who we become? So you have a guardian angel, but at the end of this um, earth evolution, before you go into the Jupiter incarnation of the earth, we become angels if you're part of what is called progressive humanity, not modern day uh, Democrat progressives, but the people who are keeping up with evolution you, if you stay with evolution, you will simply become an angel through your spiritual development. Well, the thing is, as soon as you become an angel, there is no more time and there is no more space. So if that's the case and you have this angelic nature, this realm of the imagination, this realm of the spirit self, is it possible that when you have a true imagination or when you contact your guardian angel, are you in fact contacting your higher self in the future, which is not bound by time and space, and then could inspire you in this moment? And it seems as if that's an older nature of yourself, a nature of the future. So the question would be, are we contacting beings who have already gone through their humanity, as Rudolf Steiner describes in his cosmology and occult science, in many other places, are we contacting through our guardian angel, angels who are donating our thoughts to us, archangels who are donating our feelings, our higher feelings to us, and archai who are donating intuitions through our willpower? This is the question, and it becomes an unsolvable dilemma. It becomes a paradox of paradoxes, and there is no correct answer for this. So therefore, when I was asked this question, the question about Vulcan is easy to answer, uh, but the question that it does exist and it's part of the seventh incarnation of the earth where we develop pure intuition and we become time spirits called archai. That is easily understood if you look at Steiner's cosmology. But when you have to answer the question of who are the super men and super women, Yes, well, Rudolf Steiner's quote uh, in one of the selections that we provide says that these beings, these super beings, are heavenly beings, and that they are not of the order of humans. So he says in one quote that they're not humans, but then again, is a human, when they're tapping into their higher three selves, are they human any longer? Certainly they are heavenly, they are tapping into the divine, and so the question is still not answered. So we're talking about how does spiritual evolution actually work? How does a human being become an angel? How does a human being become an archangel? And at that time, we need to remember that in the past, there were donations of even higher hierarchy, the thrones, the curiotities, the dynamis, the exousiae, 
all donated substances to the human being in the ancient three periods that I made reference to, which then constitute what has been left over as the three elemental kingdoms, which Rudolf Steiner calls ancient Saturn, ancient sun, ancient moon, and now we're on the earth. But as you evolve from one incarnation of the earth to the next, through the first three, and then you reach the fourth one, the earth proper, the beings who made their donations in ancient Saturn were actually the archai, and they were human beings at that time. Same with ancient sun, those were donated uh, by uh, other hierarchical, hierarchical beings who then worked through the archangels. And on ancient moon, it was the angels who took their human form. So when you say angels, archangels, archai, if you look to the far distant past, they were human for a period of time. They didn't become absolute physical humans as we do in the earth proper incarnation of the earth. Uh, as we find ourselves now as a human that is evolving um, into these higher hierarchy. And that's why it's so important for people to uh, take their spiritual evolution seriously, because the earth will not be this physical thing that we experience right now. Always, it will too evolve. And if you come back in another reincarnation and your planet has already ascended, how will you ever find a suitable body or a suitable situation to live out your karma? You can't. You get left behind. Now, eventually you get picked up in another cycle. But there, there is no Hil place for Hillary Clinton or someone like that in an evolved earth. Yes, and that's the thing that is uh, often accompanying these uh, references to super beings, from uh, Mercury, Venus, and Vulcan are references to the spider brood, the spider web that is created by literally hierarchical beings above the human realm who then entrap human beings in the lower realm because of materialism, because of shadow thinking, as he calls it. And what happens there is that they do not evolve with progressive humanity. They remain behind. Now, Rudolf Steiner points out when he says that the Lucifer who fell from heaven was the highest angel. Well, there are Luciferic falls in all nine of the hierarchy. So there are beings, even at the realm of the spirits of form, the exousiae, that the being of Christ works out of that realm. He isn't from that realm, but he works through that realm because he is a being of the uh, Trinity. But there are beings in the realm of form who work against humanity. There are beings in the realm of motion, beings uh, in the realm of the wisdom, in the realm of the willpower, of harmony, of love. All these higher hierarchies also have a, a negative reflection from those beings who are held back. And they're held back by their own choice of will, by their own free decision to remain behind. He calls them retarded beings. So when we're talking about humanity at this point, he sadly points out that one third of humanity will evolve into angels, but two thirds of humanity will not. So then you have to ask the question, what will happen to them? Well, this spider network, this web of shadow thinking will actually hold them back. And one could imagine that they fall back into the realm of animals or even into plants, or even into the mineral realm. Or, or I like the, the vision of the slug people. That just says it so much. Yes. That's what Rudolf says, Steiner calls it. Yes, and he says that uh, in this spider realm, there will be um, swarms of locusts. And then he describes that there are locust people who are not human anymore, and they're walking around, and they don't have a spirit. They have a body and partially a soul, but they do not have a spirit. And that's what he's talking about in terms of two thirds of humanity that will not progress forward to become angels at the end of the incarnation of the earth that we are in now. So these are very scary topics. And oftentimes when he's referring to these beings, these superhuman beings who are helping us now, who have come down and he actually brought spiritual science. He actually says that spiritual science and anthroposophy is inspired by these beings and that we must learn to recognize them, to, uh, in fact, commune with them. 
and we must learn their language. So I just want to give a practical example. So when you when you think, when you have a big thought, where where does that thought come from? And it's not from within you. I mean, you hold you are the vessel that can hold the thought. You have the capacity to understand the thought, but that thought is an angel coming over you and leaving you with this with the essence of its angelhood and that appears to you as a thought but inspiration where people who are inspired or when you have the experience of synchronicity those are experiences of higher beings standing in front of you they're not going to be in a physical form you have to understand that they're at a higher level you reach out to that level and you will see angels and archangels all around you. Now, uh, once many years ago, we were looking at that crazy uh, telescope that's on Mount Graham. It's called Lucifer. And I guess the Vatican owns it. I can't remember if the Pope has been there or not, but they keep looking in the sky for something. I don't, are they still doing it? I don't know, but they would describe them as these fuzzy light balls of fire or light that were coming towards the earth. Well, when I see that, I go, well, of course, the angels are coming. They're coming to assist us for those of us that can see them. But if you don't exist or have your organs of perception developed to the point that you can experience them at that level, you will just see the shadow images of them. So these would be the things that people look in the sky now, not the satellites, but they will see images of light or they are objects that they can't make out. And it's always kind of a shadowy situation. There's never really clear photography. That's because they're having the experience of these higher beings, but because they lack the organs of perception to understand what that is, they see them in that way. So many of us remember Carl Sagan when we were children that would explain to us how the different dimensions work. And if you are in living in the flatliners with the flatliners or the flatlines or I can't remember that, but in the second dimension, if a third dimensional being comes to you, you can't perceive it in the third dimension. You lack that organ of perception. So what you see is just the plane, the bottom of it, that it comes in and out. So open up and understand that of having a relationship and a perception of higher beings requires higher organs of perception. Yes, the current uh, Pope, Francis, is an amateur astronomer, and he had hoped to go visit Mount Graham when he came to visit the southern border of America when he was visiting here. And um, I don't know whether he made it there or not, just like you, I can't remember. But yes, this um, dual telescope looks out into the world, into the cosmos, and constantly sees through its infrared um, nature these beings of light. And he says, and he's made this statement repeatedly, and you can find it in articles that we've written, that these beings, these extraterrestrial beings have come to the earth in the past and will come to the earth in the future. This is a form of spiritual materialism that is truly pathetic. You see, uh, Trevor Constable wrote a book, um, The Cosmic Pulse of Life, and he took orgone uh, energy, orgone boxes, out to the desert, high plateaus of the desert, and there he was able to create these and film them with infrared photography. That He called them warmth critters, warmth creatures. But he also noticed that they appear um, along the uh, electrical lines that are um, strung all over our country. And that whether they be warmth or whether they actually be um, electromagnetic reactions to the fact that electricity, according to Rudolf Steiner, is created by angels falling into matter. So oftentimes the lower shadow of spiritual beings is considered to be real and independent on its own, but that isn't necessarily true. As I mentioned before, higher hierarchical beings have donated things that other beings who are still above us came to their human experience in, but even below that are the elemental kingdoms. So, it is easy to confuse the idea that when you see an angel, that you may actually think that it is some UFO or an alien, or as Cliff High likes to call them, the bug. 
Uh, but that is a bunch of silliness. For instance, let's look at how many times we have recorded history telling us that saints had ball lightning, though there was no storm going on, come right into their room. And uh, matter of fact, one saint had um, their sister killed by this ball lightning. Uh, saint Jerome had it happen to him and many others. This ball lightning, what is the ball lightning? Is that a manifestation of a UFO, of an alien being, of a multidimensional being? Or is it a natural phenomena that is created by the diaphanous veil between the physical and spiritual is rent for a moment? That is probably what it is. And we need to remember that when this happens, you can, if you start to believe that they are entities or that they are some higher consciousness, instead of just the shadow manifestation of spiritual beings, then you will devolve into the past, into animals, plants, and minerals, instead of evolve into angels, archangels, and archai. Well, before you go too far, let's go back to the angels falling into matter. I want to give another example. Crop circles. When we see crop circles, the geometry is so breathtaking and each one of them is so beautiful. Now, of course, I know that there are people that go out and do some man-made things, but we all know that the crop circles that we're seeing of light, they're just, they're beyond anything a human being can do. When I look at that, I know these are beings of a higher vibration who are perfectly beautiful and their beauty is in their, their geometry and they press upon the physical world. Now they can't come and land in the physical world because they don't have a physical body. So they, they alight on the top of the wheat and the corn and they press upon it and they are showing us who they are and the beauty that they are. Well, Tyler, you are tapping into so many different unsolved mysteries that it's just wonderful because we have to open our imagination and get away from sense-bound thinking if we are to understand what these superhuman beings are and how they come to us. For instance, if one were to see their guardian angel, according to Rudolf Steiner, most people would think that they were seeing God, but they were actually just experiencing the first of the hierarchy of nine hierarchies with the Trinity above that. So what we think that we're seeing and needs to leave behind sense-bound thinking and move into a realm where imagination can show us these beings and then move into the realm where they teach us an alphabet and then move into the realm where that alphabet becomes a language where we can communicate with those beings. So whether it's your guardian angel, which one can even say is directly in contact with your higher self, or one of your three higher spiritual selves that you might be contacting, or let's say that you experienced an archangel like the Archangel Michael or any of the other six major archangels, if you were to experience them, then you would understand what a folk spirit is. You would understand the entire uh, an entire nation or tribe of people that uses a specific language. And with that power, you would be able to go back into time. With the uh, witnessing of an angel, you would basically transcend space. You can transcend time if you contact an archangel. And you can um, basically reach into the realm of the archai, which all three of those, whether it be your guardian angel, angel, archangel, or archai, those are of the future. You're actually reaching into the future. But then again, there is no such thing as time and space for hierarchical beings above the human realm. So therefore, do you already have the power through the grace and mercy of the divine to witness, to experience, to contact your own higher thinking, feeling, and willing through imagination, inspiration, intuition? These are the kind of questions that you have to ask, and you can only get answers when you leave behind the physical world and stop thinking in earthbound thoughts, shadow thinking, materialism, and move into the realm where you can start to have all 12 of your senses stimulated by these beings who then are always there to help you, whether it be the being of Anthroposophia, whether it be Sophia, whether it be the rank of the Curiotites, the beings of wisdom through Sophia, 
whether it be Mother Mary, who has appeared as uh, the lovely lady or many other forms and versions than just the Catholic throughout time, whether it be your guardian angel, whether it be ball lightning that comes that you witness because they'll tell you ball lightning doesn't exist. What is it? These are things that are beyond physical sense perception. And that's what you need if you're going to understand these mysteries. Okay, I want to bring it down to some more practical experiences that people may be having and they just didn't realize that these are the spiritual beings speaking to them. But you said something very important. So you have to be very quiet. You have to turn off the TV and the electronics so that you can hear the whispers and the signs and the signals from these higher beings. Many of you will say that you always seem to look at the clock at 11, 11, as though it is a gateway and it is a gateway. It's nudging you to say, pay attention. Sometimes that it is a number that comes up as two, two, two. It's the spiritual world knocking at the door saying, hey, you pay attention. And then when you go into your meditation, the idea of the meditation is that you want to think about thinking. You don't want to think about the everyday world stuff. We won't go there, but we'll have to do a video on that sometime, Douglas. And then you will no, they will, then you will notice that your world around you becomes symbols, metaphors of the spiritual world speaking to you. And you'll see it more and more, the quieter you get. Another experience you might have is you're driving in a car, you, your mind is, is, is blank, but you're conscious, you're fully conscious, and it will feel like there are beings inside of your head, but they're like kissing you from the inside. And I would explain this to Douglas and he being the Rudolf Steiner expert here, would say, you know, Steiner talked about that, that the beings would come and chew at you. Can you say something about that? Yes, uh, John Barnwell and I just did a talk about what does it feel like when angels, archangels, and archai come into imagination, inspiration, intuition. And he says that when you experience angels uh, and the heavenly hosts, it's as if you had stuck your head into an ant heap. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's just a million things going on all independently, and it seems as if you're uh, overwhelmed. Well, the next time we talk, we're going to get into just how overwhelming it is to see these beings, to experience, hear them, to experience them, to have them work through you. And it is the most terrifying thing that you could ever experience. Well, I don't find it terrifying when it happens. I just, I see it as kisses. So I guess your perception is what drives that. Or your, you know, if I have to, one more thing before you go on, because I, I can feel it coming. So we created in our home something called the answer room. It's pretty famous around these parts for people who can actually make it to our home. And we have created a space in our, uh, that is, it's just very spiritual. And we've used sigils and other devices to clear out all of the detrimental energies and waves that are coming in there. And we invite people to come and sit in the room if they have problems, questions, concerns. All they need to do is sit in there. They don't have to tell us what the problem is and just open up to spirit and just sit there in a, a moment of quiet. And they, all, they always find when they leave, uh, almost suddenly they have answers to their questions. But anybody can create that space. And have you created that space? Have you found some crystals, a place of an altar, a maybe a candle lit? some sigils, a place where you can go quiet your mind and connect with the higher beings. We encourage you to do that. Well, you mentioned crystals. Crystals, Rudolf Steiner says, are a hollow space. And inside of that hollow space, the gods speak. He literally says that crystals, especially uh, quartz crystals that are absolutely pure and clear, are a space for the higher beings to speak. Well, when you go back and look at the elemental kingdoms, the first elemental kingdom is the kingdom of minerals. And those were donated by the hierarchical beings called the thrones, the beings of will. So when you are contacting, whether it's mineral, plant, animal, you should be able to see what he calls uh, nirvana, para nirvana, maha para nirvana. In other words, these realms are open to you if you have eyes, ears to see, and a heart that uh, can open to it with love. So you mentioned synchronicity with numbers. Some people are terrified and will oftentimes come in um, 
ask me questions about how freaked out they get that every time they look at something, there's a synchronicity of numbers, whether it be 1111 or a, a sequence of numbers or so on and so forth. And at first, it terrifies them. But what that is showing is that there is no time as you go into the spiritual world. And then they also will have experiences where it, they become spaceless. They actually can um, see things at a distance, or they can um, see things in the future, and it seems as if they're actually there. Uh, or they might have an experience of deja vu, or experience of precognition, or visions. All of these things, when they first come to someone who's not experienced, and like you say, they seem like kisses, yes, to someone who knows what they are and knows that they're contacting higher beings or their higher self, they seem like a, uh, a welcome visitor. But for those who aren't, they can terrify them. But the same is true for people who have dreams. I've known numerous people who told me they never had a dream before in their whole life. And so I said, well, that's easily remedied. And I gave them a double terminated crystal and said, keep this within three feet of your head. And they had dreams, the first dream they ever had. And a few of them came back and said, here, take back this crystal. This was the most terrifying experience of my life is to have a dream. Because why? In a dream, it's spaceless, it's timeless, and you're not really in control of your own willpower. Well, this is terrifying to most people. So in the very first stage of initiation, you reach into the astral light. But to do so, you have to realize that you're going to see things upside down, inside out, and backwards. Time will flow backwards. You will be looking at it as if you are in control of yourself. It seems as if the ground underneath you has been uh, swept away, in some cases as you're going across this threshold, into the realm of the astral light. It seems like you're crossing burning ground. Can we say also here, so that people won't be too alarmed, um, you can have an experience where you see disembodied heads kind of floating around. They're called the grotesque faces, and they exist in this realm. But just just know that they're not going to harm you and just push through it to get into the higher realms. Yes, well, there's also so much that movies have done to terrify people. So there's movie after movie that say that if you light a candle and you're looking in a mirror, then all of a sudden your face starts to become hideous terrifying and monstrous. And then if you um, aren't careful, it comes to possess you. Well, Rudolf Steiner points out that you can simply look at a person and there's actually spiritual exercises you can do, not that he taught because he wouldn't uh, teach anything quite so base, but there are many uh, paths that certainly I've studied to try to understand these things where just looking at people and letting your eyes no longer focus, you'll start to see an aura around them, a glowing white light. Well, that is actually a physiological visual function. But if you look uh, closely at them and look in their eyes, pretty soon you'll see that the eyes come together and there's only one eye. And that becomes terrifying because it seems as if their face is distorting and all kinds of things are happening. And then if you can go through that stage to the stage where you are now focused on everything other than their eye and their face, and you're uh, opening your vision to the whole uh, experience of what the room or the environment is presenting to you, then it becomes even more scary. And it seems as if you have lost reality and that you've uh, gone into spacelessness, timelessness, and that you no longer can control yourself because these um, visual impressions can become quite overwhelming. That is a natural function of the human body, you see. And so when you go to sleep at night, there's a thing called, there's different stages. Uh, there's the first stage called rapid eye movement. And then there's the stage of, well, there's the stage of uh, dreaming, dreamless sleep and trans consciousness. So this is most interesting because Rudolf Steiner tells his pupils, the aspirants on the path to the spirit, that you should do the rukshau. And the rukshau is remembering your day at just before you go to sleep after you've done your prayers, remember your day in backwards order. But instead of this time seeing it from your own eyes, see it from the eyes of the people that you encountered in the day. In other words, 
see it in the way that you affect them. Get out of your selfish perspective, become selfless, and go backwards in your day to see how you affected others. Now, this takes a lot of practice. It's very hard to do. And once you get good at it, you can develop the capacity that as you're reviewing your day quite consciously in a backwards order, you will understand the karmic ramifications of what you said or did or felt with someone in your environment. And that's good because then you can say to yourself, oh, well, tomorrow I need to rectify the fact that I said this um, un insensitive thing, this, this cruel thing to someone else, or I did something cruel to someone else. And then you can use the rukshaw, the going backwards in time as a way to not only review your day to, to clear your conscience, but because physiologically, when we go to sleep, it has been demonstrated rapid eye movement happens because your eyes relax and the muscles of your eyes, as they are re relaxing, do the same exact motion of looking up, down, left and right, uh, forward uh, with perspective and such. They repeat those motions in rapid eye movement. So in a short period of time, you repeat what your eyes did in the day. Well, that is a bit of a taste of what the rukshaw is. And then after you get through rapid eye movement and you go into a, a state of dreaming, many people pass right through that state because they haven't developed themselves enough to be able to see, experience with your 12 senses uh, here. And uh, all 12 senses are can be active in a dream. They go right past the dream state into dreamlessness. And that's fine because that's where some of the deepest dreaming, uh, deepest um, rest will happen. But you can also go into a trance consciousness. And when you're in trance consciousness, when you're asleep, you have the capacity to again transcend time. And you may actually be given precognitive understanding of what is about to happen. And the longer you practice the Rukshaw, after years and years and years of practice, you can get through the rapid eye movement quicker because you've just repeated your day backwards and what you saw, said, and did. And then you can get into your dreaming state where you can process all of your fears as you're crossing the threshold. You're always faced with your fears of um, fear, doubt, and hatred. And if you can process that, then you can go into dreamless sleep, get deep rest. That then means you might only have to sleep uh, a very small amount of time to get tremendous um, resuscitation from your sleep. But if you can get into the trance state, then you can be used by the spiritual world uh, exomatosis is what uh, Daskal has called it, but you can actually participate with beings in the spiritual world in the halls of wisdom, or there's many, many names for it. Uh, it's like going into a spiritual school where you are then instructed because you have already digested your day, understood what you've done right and wrong, been your own judge before you get into that realm, and then you may be able to return with something that can be quite valuable for being able to understand your karma and being able to help other people through love and through freedom, not by compulsion. So these are fantastic areas of mystery that we are addressing. And um, uh, usually I don't uh, give such a uh, brief answers on such things. I try to make sure to develop the whole picture so that you can understand it. But this is what is necessary if you really wish to contact these superhuman beings from Vulcan, because those are the ones who live in your willpower and turn necessity into freedom through love. And when that happens, you can come back from the spiritual world, whether through meditation, a vision, or through sleep, uh, and into this deep, deep state of sleep, uh, so that you can then have the courage to be able to go out and bring what it is that you know as your part of enlightenment through love to other people. This is the process of initiation. And each one of us individually will go through the process of initiation to reach the higher worlds. And maybe you did your process long ago, decades ago, maybe a few years ago, but we all go through it. And now the earth itself is going through it. Our planet is going through this process. And that's why everyone in the world today is being affected by the same experience. We, we know what that is. And it, it is, it is comforting to know 
that there are higher beings around us ready to help us. But you have to decide in your heart to reach out to them and ask for the help and then become quiet enough inside yourself to listen to what they're saying. That's right, Tyla. As Rudolf Steiner uses the phrase a lot, the ever-present help of the spiritual world. Um, the being of Sophia, who he calls Anthroposophia, one of her three aspects, Anthroposophia, is always there as the midwife to birth your soul into the spirit realm. And she literally, he says, passes through you, literally physically, he says, this being Anthroposophia is a human being that does not have a physical body and passes through you every time you take a step in spiritual development. And that's how concerned the divine world is with every single step that you take. And so some of the things I've described may be frightening. And yes, as Dyla also just pointed out, it's a path of initiation. The path of initiation, you must go first through probation. You must be um, go through trials, through tribulations. You must be tested. And only when you are prepared to handle these things will they come to you. Otherwise, they can be misconstrued and simply lead you into the past, into devolution instead of into the future spiritual evolution.